This video is supported by Raycon. On May 20th, 2019, the world changed. You probably didn't notice it, but the weight of everything in the world became just a little bit different that day. That's because the kilogram, the standard unit of mass in the metric system, got redefined for the first time in 130 years. Scientists spent five years on this, and the reason is because since 1889, the kilogram was defined as the weight of a single platinum iridium cylinder housed in a vault at the International Bureau of Weights and Measures in Sevres, France. Granted, there were copies of it all around the world, but that object was the standard. It was known as the International Prototype Kilogram, or as its friends called it, Big K. Every time you weighed apples at a store, every shipping container that gets weighed at a checkpoint, every building that gets made gets determined, ultimately, by Big K. So, it was a problem when they realized that Big K was shrinking. In the time that Big K had been the world's definition of a kilogram, it had lost 50 micrograms. Now, that's only about the weight of a human eyelash, but science sometimes deals in very tiny amounts, so that discrepancy matters. Maybe even harder to wrap your brain around is the fact that this 50 microgram lighter kilogram is still the kilogram. So, is it, is it 50 micrograms of the old kilogram or 50 of the new smaller micrograms of the new... Oh, my head hurts. The point is a standard measurement needs to be unchanging, and objects are just going to change over time. You know, atoms decay, elements react, there's nothing you can do about it. And that's why there's been a push for decades now to update our standards of measurement to universal constants instead of actual things. The meter used to be measured the same way. It was determined as one millionth the distance from the North Pole to the equator, but the standard meter was a metal bar until 1983 when they affixed it to the speed of light. The second was affixed to oscillations in the hyperfine transition of a cesium-133 atom. But the kilogram, that, that was a bit more challenging. Because mass is inherently a property of physical objects and physical objects change, so how do you affix a unit of mass to a universal constant? Their solution was to base it on the Planck constant using something called a kibble balance. Uh, a kibble balance basically figures out how many joules are in something according to the whole E equals MC squared thing. And the number of joules in a kilogram is 6.62607015 times 10 to the negative 34. It's complicated, but it works. This democratizes the kilogram. Basically, anybody with an instrument sensitive enough can now determine what a kilogram is. You don't have to go to some government body for calibration. This finally fulfills the mission of the metric system, a system designed for all times for all people. The adoption of the metric system changed the world in all kinds of ways. But if the founders of the metric system had their way, it would have changed things even more, all the way down to how we keep time. The metric system. It's a 200-year-old system of measurement designed to bring equality and standardization to the world. And to tell whether or not somebody's an American. All right, let me just say real quick, look, I, I, I know I use imperial units a lot of times in my videos, and every time I do, I get angry comments from people all around the world uh, calling me an ugly American and stuff like that. Look, look just let me, let me just say, like, I don't do it to make some kind of nationalist statement or anything. It's just sometimes in the articles that I look up, it's in imperial units, and I'm just, I'm basically just too lazy to convert it. That's, that's really what it comes down to. So if you could not take it as a personal attack, I would appreciate that. But to make it up to you, today I'm going to talk all about the metric system, which actually got its start way earlier than we think it did. All the way back in 1670, a French priest and mathematician, Gabriel Moton, proposed a decimal system of measurement. He's often considered the founding father of the metric system. He based his standard unit of length on one arc minute of a great circle around the Earth. He also proposed a unit of length as a pendulum swing length with one beat per second frequency, which is around 25 centimeters. A couple of years earlier, in 1668, an English clergyman by the name of John Wilkins had proposed a system to measure area, length, mass, and volume. For length, he called it the standard, and it was a pendulum's length that had a one-second half-beat. Volume was a cubic standard, area was a square, and mass was a cubic standard of rainwater. The English and French had a friendly working relationship at the time, so it's possible that Moton and Wilkins kind of knew of each other's work. For example, Wilkins' ideas included some of the essentials of the original metric system, such as a relationship between volume and length, a relationship between mass and volume, a universal standard for length, and decimal multiplication and division to achieve more units. 
More than 100 years later, France's National Assembly used some of these ideas to create their new decimal-based system of measurement, one where every single multiple of 10 creates a new unit. This was a big thing, and it was sorely needed. If you went to an early European marketplace, it was this confusing mix of measures and standards and weights that was just designed to make you want to drill a hole in your head. Like they all had different units of measurement, like milk had its own unit of measurement, wine had a different unit of measurement, and uh, they had different units based on where they were in the process, like at, at extraction, retail, and wholesale, they used different units for all those. It was almost like every product had its own currency and you had to convert denominations every time you bought something. What's the ratio of Stanley Nichols to shrewd bucks? The same as the ratio of unicorns to leprechauns. By the way, this lack of standardization is one of the reasons why Napoleon to this very day is thought of as a short guy and why a Napoleon complex is a short guy overcompensating for his height. Because before the metric system, the French used a foot as a unit of measurement, just like the British did, only the French foot, or pied, I think is how it's pronounced, uh, was actually about an inch longer than the British foot. So when the Brits heard that Napoleon was just over five feet tall, they were thinking in British feet, but that was actually meant in French feet, which would have put him closer to like five foot six in British feet, which is still not tall necessarily, but around average for the time. In fact, some estimates have put the number of different units of measurement being used in France before the metric system at around 250,000. So yeah, it, it needed fixing. And France was in a bit of a fixing sh mood, what with the French Revolution and the removing of heads from bodies and eating of cake and whatnot. She told them to eat cake and they ate some cake. France after the revolution was all about remaking society in every way. They weren't just deposing a king, they were dragging Europe kicking and screaming out of the dark ages. This was the climax of the enlightenment period. A hundred years of science and questioning and rethinking of social norms all being put into action. They were throwing off the old ways of kings and fiefdoms. It was, it was power to the people, egalitarianism and democracy. And the metric system was part of that. Standardizing measures meant people at the top couldn't cheat people down at the bottom. You know, with 250,000 different units of measurement, there's a, a lot of room for shenanigans there. Plus, the revolutionary saw it as a, as a tangible way to show the public that a, a new government was in charge. So France adopted the metric system in 1795. It was meant to be based on nature, impartial, universal, and everlasting, for all times, for all peoples. And because people are always super swell at adapting to new things, everybody accepted it immediately with no pushback whatsoever. Except no, that totally didn't happen. People fought it tooth and nail. The military had to be called in to enforce it. Merchants were arrested for not using it. Even Napoleon got tired of fighting it and just gave up after a while. You know, the merchants have been using these systems for decades. They've been handed down from their fathers and grandfathers and so forth. They were, they were traditions. And plus it meant that they had to buy new scales and new equipment and all that. It totally messed with local economies. It wasn't fully embraced until 1840. It was a four decade transition. And even then, there were certain parts of the metric system that just never quite caught on. Like metric time. Yes, there was an attempt to create a metric system of time, also known as decimal time. Because for the same reasons, you know, time is kind of messy. I mean, 24 hours in a day, what's that about? Round numbers, please. So that's what they did. From midnight to midnight, a day was counted up as 10 hours. 10 hours made up of 100 decimal minutes, which were made up of 100 decimal seconds. So one decimal hour was about the same as two hours and 24 minutes in our current time. So five o'clock was considered noon. This base 10 thinking extended into weeks, which were gonna be 10 days long. And instead of naming the days after random emperors and gods and stuff, they were named with Latin prefixes that denoted what point in the week they were. So the first day was Primidi, second day was Duodi, third day was Trididi, and so forth. At the month level is where the base 10 structure kind of broke down because months are generally arranged around lunar cycles, which don't give a damn about your obsessive compulsive system of measurement. So there were still 12 months, each of exactly 30 days made up of three weeks each, which were called decades. Desades? Deca? Desade? <laughs> Anyway, they named the months after the seasons and the weather for that time of the year, and they started it in September in our Gregorian calendar, because I don't know why. Oh, and if you're wondering exactly what weekends look like in a 10-day week, people were expected to take one day off every 10 days. Gee, I wonder why this didn't take off. What, what is a weekend? Actually, the concept of a weekend, weekend, wasn't really a thing at the time, but the idea of the Sabbath, a day of rest, was. Now, this was supposed to be a totally secular calendar, but the idea of keeping a day of rest stuck. But maybe that only one day every 10 days thing was all right, because you actually got a whole week off. 
Any of you math whizzes may have figured out that 12 months of 30 days each only comes out to 360 days. So what happened to those other five or six days? Yeah, those are basically added to the end of the calendar year as national holidays. They were called the sans colloidities? Sans colloidal? Sans colloidal? <laughs> Guys, I'm trying. And they were named to celebrate the various virtues that they felt were embodied in the revolution with a leap day every four years that celebrated the revolution itself. France really gave this a go. It was a really important part of this new metric system and this new, you know, reimagining of society. But whereas people finally eventually caved on things like the kilogram and the millimeter and whatnot, metric time just never quite stuck. Was it really because people had to work nine days before getting a day off instead of just working six days? I mean, I'm sure that didn't help. They also had to wait a full year before getting five days off in a row. And those five days were in the fall too, which was when a lot of harvests came in, like grapes and stuff. So people were gonna be spending these days off actually working. And then there was the religion problem, you know? The, the seven day week is in the Bible. This is when people go to church. This messed with people's very sacred traditions. So yeah. But really the main reason is that France had trade agreements and shared borders with other countries that used the Gregorian calendar, which has made everything more confusing and more difficult, which, is the exact opposite of what the metric system was designed to do. It turned out time didn't really need fixing. Now, one of the reasons why the metric system was demonstrably better was because it standardized a system of measurements when there were like all these different types of measurements out there and nobody could agree on it. Time though had pretty much already been sorted out. Everybody was on the same page with that one and had been for a while. It might not have been pretty, but it worked. And for that, we have Pope Gregory the 13th to thank. The Gregorian calendar that bears his name was sort of a refinement on the Julian calendar from the Roman days. They, of course, took things from the Egyptians, and the Egyptians took things from the Babylonians, who were the first ones to divide hours and minutes into 60 segments. That Julian calendar is actually pretty close to what we've got right now. 12 months with 30 and 31 days, with one short 28-day month, with a leap day every four years, and this was set up in 46 BCE, so it's pretty impressive. The problem is that the Julian calendar is 365.25 days long, and the Earth takes 365.2422 days to orbit the Sun. Now that's super close, but over time that does add up. Um, it adds up to about one day every 128 years, which by 1577 in Pope Gregory's time, that means the calendar was off by about two weeks. So Pope Greg appointed a commission to correct the problem, led by astronomer Christopher Clavius and physician Aloysius Lilius. It took them five years to come up with the answer. Why do these things always take five years? The answer was to just eliminate those two weeks. And then they refined the leap year rules so that centennial year is not divisible by 400 are excluded. For example, we had a leap year in 2000 because it was divisible by 400, but we didn't have one in 1900. We won't have one in 2100. In fact, leap year days on centennial years are actually kind of rare. I wish I'd known that in 2000. I would have made a bigger deal out of that one. But perhaps the biggest change from the Julian to the Gregorian calendar was they made January 1st the beginning of the year. Previously, it had been on March 25th, which was the Feast of Annunciation. So because Gregory was the Pope, and it's good to be the Pope, um, the Catholic world basically adopted it right away, meaning that Italy, Spain, and Portugal adopted it almost immediately. But just like it took a while for everybody to go metric, it took a very long time for people to delete two weeks from their lives and go Gregorian. In fact, the British and the American colonies didn't get on board with this till 1752. Benjamin Franklin commented on the event saying, quote, it is pleasant for an old man to be able to go to bed on September 2nd and not have to get up until September 14th. But by the time the French revolutionaries tried to upend the whole system, pretty much the entire Western world was on board with the Gregorian calendar and the whole thing just seemed unnecessary. That has not stopped people from trying to improve on it though. There's the International Fixed Calendar proposed by British accountant Moses B. Cotsworth in 1902. It divides the year into 13 months of 28 days each with an additional day tacked on to the end of the year. A new month named Sol would fall between June and July. All months would begin on a Sunday and end on a Saturday. And believe it or not, the Eastman Kodak Company used this calendar from 1928 to 1989 because the founder George Eastman was apparently a fan. Then you have the world calendar that Elizabeth Achilles promoted in 1930. This calendar is divided into four quarters of 91 days each, 31, 30, and 30 days respectively. 
A leave day is added at the end of the second quarter, and an additional day called World's Day is also tacked on at the end of the year. Much more recently, in the last decade, Stephen H. Hanke and Richard Kahn Henry from Johns Hopkins University came up with the Hanke Henry Permanent Calendar. Just like the World Calendar, it has four quarters of 91 days, but their months go 30, 30, 31, giving it a 364-day year. And they make up for that with a full week they call Extra Week every five or six years. The main point of this calendar is it's a perennial calendar, meaning dates will always fall on the same day of the week. For example, October 4th would always fall on a Wednesday. But believe it or not, there are some use cases where metric time or decimal time is still used, especially in computation. Unix time counts the number of seconds since January 1st, 1970 in place of a date and time. Microsoft's file name is a 64-bit value that represents the number of 100 nanosecond intervals that have elapsed since January 1st, 1601, coordinating universal time. VAX VMS uses the number of 100 nanoseconds since November 17th, 1858. And RASC OS depicts the time in centiseconds since January 1st, 1900. These are all obviously very niche applications, but you could maybe consider them the ghost of metric time. Now there are, of course, other calendar systems based on different cultures and religions around the world that have also stood the test of time. And I think maybe the reason they have stood the test of time is the same reason that metric time didn't really win out over the Gregorian calendar. It's because time is very personal. It's literally our most precious resource. It's, it's, it's something you can never get back once it's gone. And that's not something we generally think about in the hustle and bustle of our lives. We probably should think about it more. But it is there in the measurement of it. You know, as I record this, we're already in March. We're closing out the first quarter of 2021, and I'm already doing that thing where it's like, oh my God, it's already March. Your birthday, your anniversaries, your days sober, your years in a job, all of these things are made tangible by a calendar. These specific important dates, they're, they're not just arbitrary measurements of time. They're, they're mile markers on your life's journey. And that's no small thing. It's hard to just burn that up and start over with something brand new. The discussion of time and the calendars that measure it are just a reminder of how precious time is and what a finite amount of it we all have and how we should make the most of it. And one good way of spending your time is listening to music. And if you want to get the most out of your music, you might want to check out today's sponsor, Raycon Earbuds. Longtime viewers have heard me talk about Raycon Earbuds, but yes, these are the actual earbuds that I use and they've got the earwax on it to prove it. I've got the black ones, but they come in a variety of colors and patterns. There's a variety of fit options, and of course they're wireless, so no cords to yank out of the ears, which makes them perfect for getting out, enjoying a good walk, being active, and just having a less sucky day. And they give you six hours on a charge, so you can do all those things uninterrupted. And apparently they're endorsed by musicians from Snoop Dogg to Melissa Etheridge. They fit snug, I can do this, I can run around, they stay put, it's good stuff. So if you'd like to try them out for yourself, you can get a 15% off discount if you go to buyraycon.com slash Joe Scott, and there's a 45 day free return policy, so there's nothing to lose. But I, I wear these all the time. I wore them just this morning when I went out for a run. I can highly recommend them. I do like these. So if you were looking for new earbuds, if you're in the market for them, I can definitely recommend them. And I like how they just snap into the little thing. You can just do that. All right, big thanks to Raycon for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the supporters on uh, the YouTube memberships as well as the Patreon people. But today I'm going to shout out some new members who have joined on YouTube. We've got, here's a good one, Zoltz Miliahafi, <laughs> Robert Courtright, Elizabeth Wagner, uh, Mona Hayford, Duzan Mudrinik, who I also saw in Patreon. So thanks a lot, man. Uh, Paul Mulcahy, Ray Flynn, Rand Blackhawk, Ronnie Smith, Cher, Lewis, Richard Reynolds, Joshua Clark, Clyde M56, and Robert Slaughter. Awesome name. Thank you guys for supporting. Um, if you would like to join them, just hit the little join button down below that gives you a membership to uh, the channel. You get early access to videos and exclusive live streams. So. Uh, go join the crowd, and uh, you also get a little thing next to your, to your name. If you look down in the comments, people have little icons next to their name. They're, they're members, so they stand out. By the way, t-shirts are available at the store at answerswithjoe.com slash store. This is actually a new one that I haven't worn before. It's like, you know, we're going to the moon. We're hugging, moon's hugging the rocket. It's kind of it's kind of cute. There, there's all kinds of fun, uh, uh, nerdy and science-based uh, t-shirts over there. Fun to wear. They look good. I like them, so go check them out. Answerswithjoe.com slash store. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, Google thinks you might like this one. So you might want to check that out. Uh, there's probably some others that are being recommended down there that have my little face on them. And uh, I encourage you to watch those. And if you do like them, uh, please do go ahead and subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday. And I can say the word subscribe, I promise. 
All right, that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.